You may be seated. Long time no see. You still, you're still here? I was wanting to say thing about you. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. JT's still here. This is fantastic. All right. Welcome to Mount Side Community Church. It is, we're nearing the end of summer, so you got to get those trips in, and then uh, we'll see everybody soon here. Uh, uh, school starts soon. So just a heads up to all the parents. Praise God. The kids are back in school. Um, speaking of that, next week, yeah, next week we're going to have um, pie and ice cream to celebrate school. We're going to be praying for all of our educators. We're going to be praying for all the kids. We're going to be praying for all the uh, college students as well. So you can be here for next week. So good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. First and foremost, there is a Connect card somewhere near you. You can uh, fill that out if you're new or newish for more information about the church. We'd love to um, explain Mountainside uh, more thoroughly to you. I will email you and just let you know um, anything that we can help you with in your Christian life. Uh, if you're a giver here at Mountainside, thank you. We appreciate that. If you're a regular attender, you should be a giver. And I just want to let you know you are helping people. You really are. So when you give, I'm reminded all the time that there are people who have been blessed and can give. There are people who are hurting and can't give. And so somehow in God's sovereign will, he works that out inside of a church and we're able to help one another. So thank you for being a giver. Uh, we have a digital bulletin now. And so I think this is fixed. You can snap this. It, my, my big head shouldn't be in the way. You can snap that on there and you will be given a digital bulletin. Uh, we're trying to save on ink, paper, printing. And honestly, um, I'm tired of picking up bulletins. So those are dead. And now you get a digital bulletin, so uh, do that. Let me announce the next few things that are happening. First, DARE is this Wednesday night at 6.30. The men will be meeting. Jerry Lang will be speaking. So first and foremost, uh, DARE this Wednesday night, 6.30. Next, next Sunday, pie and ice cream. So please come uh, support our kids. We'll be praying for all of our educators. Uh, next, baptism class coming up. If you have not been baptized you need to be baptized if you're a Christian. So we're offering two classes on August 20th and 27th. Pastor Dave will be uh, teaching those. And you just need to attend one. It doesn't mean you get baptized. It simply means you receive more information so that you can make an informed decision. Also, our youth group is changing here soon. Tonight is the last night of the old style of youth group on Sunday nights. Starting next week, the middle school students, uh, I've, I noticed this, I roll better with it, but Pastor Dave had a big complaint that multiple times during his teaching, uh, middle school students were falling asleep, right? And they were actually falling over, and they weren't slain in the spirit, they were just bored to death. And so I'm used to that. Pastor Dave finally got to experience that. And so Christy Briggs, our uh, youth director, is going to be offering youth group Sunday mornings for middle school students. So if you're a middle school student, you'll come in, you'll worship with us, and then you'll go to the counseling room and receive your lecture. Is that right? Totally a lecture. Okay. <laughs> so middle schools, and then high school students, we will change from Sunday nights to Wednesday nights from 7 to 8 p.m. So that's coming up as well. Uh, before we get to our next worship set, let me just pray. Father God, I do thank you for each and every person who's here. Father, we love them, but most importantly, you love them. I pray that you would calm our hearts, allow us to orient our, our hearts towards you. Whatever we came here worried about, if it's uh, food, clothing, shelter issues, Father, we know that you will provide. We have faith in you. If it's personal issues that we are dealing with, if there's battles, sin, temptation, struggles, uh, sadness, unanswered prayers, Father, we would lay those at the cross of Christ this morning. And we're here to worship you, learn more about you, come to you with soft hearts. Father, um, this is a time where we can stop worrying about someone else and we can simply acknowledge our own heart before you. Give us a restful, encouraging time this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. JT, thanks for choosing an old hymn. I like old hymns, so... Uh, we basically made a request a number of weeks ago that we throw in an old hymn now and again, and JT graciously, uh, I, I appreciate it. <clears throat> well, I'm never here, so I, this is the first one I've heard. So, uh, it is well with my soul. If you don't know what that means, it simply means 
Uh, no matter what you're going through, no matter what trials, no matter how much pain, agony, sorrow, persecution, sadness, you really can have a soul that is okay. Christ loves you. He died for you. He paid the penalty for all of your sin. Though things on this earth can go bad at times, at least you're okay for eternity, and God can give you peace in the middle of some really big storms. So, um, very thankful for that. <clears throat> so, um, we are on, you asked for it. So, I missed a week. Uh, Dave, Pastor Dave filled in. I appreciate that. And so, I wanted to finish up our questions for you asked for it. I, I'm actually not finishing up. There's, there's a number of questions I'm going to miss. If I missed your question, uh, please reach out. So, every year for a couple of Sundays... Uh, you give me your questions, and then I answer them. Uh, Pastor Dave and I were thinking of one time getting up here and sitting down, and then you just throw questions randomly at us. And I was thinking, no. And uh, so we'll see how that one goes. Wow, Dave, I was not expecting that. <clears throat> Ooh, it, it's funny what things we think you're going to love and things we're going to hate, and uh, we're often wrong. So, yeah, yeah, it's not a question. You don't just get to comment. <laughs> it has to be in, in the phrase of a question. So you asked for it. So I, I want to move along quickly through these. I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. Question number one. Oh, it's, it's always my favorite question. This is from one of the Mountainside Kids. They videoed this and sent it in. Why aren't there dinosaurs in the Bible? This is like, of all the questions, I, I, we did, I've done this for years. This is one of my favorite ones. Why aren't there dinosaurs in the Bible? So, um, this is a Bible. If you haven't seen it in printed form in a while, um, this is a Bible. I'm all for Bible on my phone. I often read Bible on my phone. But I would encourage you to own a Bible, okay, please? Um, or 12, uh, put one anywhere, everywhere around you. Have Bibles near you. You should be in, in the Word of God. Uh, the point of this Bible is the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the point. I'm sorry if I ruin that for anybody, but that's the point of the Bible. Honestly, in my flesh, I wish that the Bible was about a lot more than that. I wish there were like YouTube videos in the index and I could watch creation and, and, and just get way more, inf honestly, way more information than this gives me is what I would want. But God wants me to have this thing called faith also. And so um, in my flesh, I want more information. But God has given me, according to the Bible, how much everything that I need for what? Life and godliness. Everything. So I wanted to, what, I, what I was thinking about doing this morning is kind of put dinosaurs into a biblical timeline. That's what we're going to try to do. So I take the book of Genesis literally. I, I take a 24-hour, seven-day, 24-hour literal creation. I don't see any reason why uh, the, the Hebrew would indicate in, in, in every way that you should be reading a literal 24-hour, seven-day, literal creation. If you don't do that, you create some other hermeneutical problems for yourself later on. Um, but uh, let me say this. That's an open-handed position. So briefly, open-handed, closed-handed. If you've never heard this, I'm going to change your life right now. So wake up. Here we go. There's quesadillas in, in, in the outside, in the foyer. There's coffee. I'm going to change your life right now by giving you this one thing. Open-handed, closed-handed positions. There are people who believe in evolution, and they are saved, and they're going to heaven, and they will be with Jesus for all of eternity. Why? Because this is an open-handed position. I don't think it's the best take, and I think you create some problems overall, but it's open-handed. How are we saved? Closed-handed position. We're saved by grace through faith. We're saved by repenting of our sin and trusting in Christ as our Savior. Now, I think if you read the Bible and you still believe in evolution, and you've repented of your sin, and you trust in Christ, and you go to heaven, I think there'll be a period of purgatory for you. But that's just my personal opinion. 
And that's an open-handed position, not a closed-handed position. So open-handed, closed-handed. Open-handed positions are things that the Bible doesn't talk about very much or, or says this is up to you and the Spirit or you and your conscience. Open-handed. Closed-handed are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like, we're not debating that. It's a closed-handed position. There are literally hundreds of verses behind most of our closed-handed positions. So, open-handed, closed-handed, here's the big picture. I have to believe that when God was creating the heavens and the earth, and God created the animals, he also created dinosaurs. I, I have to believe that. That's the way I read God's word. So then I have to believe that dinosaurs were walking around with men on the earth at the same time. I have to believe that if I'm reading a literal Genesis account. And then people will say, okay, so here's, the, here's, we have a bunch of dinosaur fossils and no dinosaurs today. So that's a problem because I would love dinosaurs today. I think it'd be fantastic. So what happened? So we have the account of creation and then you have mankind messing everything up immediately. I don't know if, I don't know if Adam and Eve were in the garden 24 hours. I'm not sure. Enough to name the animals and then immediately sin. So then you have sin, and then you have this cataclysmic event known as Noah's Ark. So this great change to the world that you know now, this great change to our atmosphere. I don't know everything there. And then, and then you have the debate. We're dinosaurs on the ark. And the only acceptable answer is, well, yes, of course they were on the ark. Closed-handed. <laughs> it's not... How do you fit a stegosaurus on the ark? Like, so, so I, per, this is my personal belief now. There are lots of baby dinosaurs on the ark and they were super cute and they're like petting them and they were feeding them and they were just all babies together and they were all on the ark. So that's my personal opinion. So then, and then what Noah's presented with after the ark is a, really a new heavens and new earth, really. Radically different. And then at that point, I think the dinosaurs just die out. I don't know that the environment that was created for them was, was hospitable anymore. But I'm going to back this up with some Bible this morning instead of my just my personal opinion. So does anybody know, this is fascinating, anybody know the oldest book in the Bible? I don't like that you all know these answers. I, I, Dave, I want to ask answers and then questions and people are like, we have no idea, Pastor Dawson. You're the only one who knows that. It's the book of Job. So Genesis records the oldest events in the Bible, but Genesis is not the oldest book of the Bible. Genesis written by who? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Pentateuch, Moses. Moses comes after Abraham. Most scholars believe that the book of Job was written around the time of Abraham. So I want to turn with me, if you have your Bibles or on your phone or whatever, to Job chapter 40. We're going to be in Job 40 and 41. So Job is, uh, anybody know Job? Job had a hard time, right? Um, Job in 40 and 41, God is now speaking to Job. Okay, so Job has his friends, and they rebuke him. Job's friends, essentially Job's friends tell Job, you have a bad life because you lived a bad life. That's called karma. That's also called reaping what you sow. And the Bible says that that's false. No such thing as karma. And you don't always reap what you sow. And Job says, no, no, I lived a good and godly life, and, but I'm... I'm I'm reaping really bad stuff. And then God comes to Job and begins to speak to him. And in Job 40, verse 17, I imagine Job sitting up on the hills and he's looking down. And in Job 40, go down to verse 17, God says, he makes his tail. He's talking about behemoth here. He's describing an animal to Job. He's saying, Job, look at this animal and think about this animal and think about the power that this animal has and if that animal has that much power, then the one who created the animal has more power. Look at Behemoth. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. In Job 40, 18, his bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. 
Now, every commentary that you will ever read in the book of Job, if you have an ESV study Bible that says this, it will say that Job's looking at a hippopotamus. Because no commentary in their right mind wants to write the word dinosaur and then basically be fired from their professorship or from the department that they work for. So I, as an unscholarly, anti-scientific, real, basically a dum-dum, I'm going to say that's a dinosaur. I don't think it's a hippopotamus. You ever seen a hippopotamus? You ever seen a hippopotamus's tail? It's not a cedar tree. So whatever's going on here, I don't know, but every commentary is going to say it's a hippo. I think this is a dinosaur. I think there are some left by the time of Abraham. I think Job is up on this hill and he's seeing a monster of an animal and, he, and, and God says, look at that animal. If I can do that like that, what can I do for you? How big and how powerful must I be? He goes on in Job 41 to describe Leviathan. He says, this is a sea creature. It's potentially like a prehistoric crocodile. Job 41, 15. And we're not even filming today. We broke everything. I do not want this on the internet. All right, Job 41, 15. His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. So he's got a rows of shields on his back. And then Job 41, 18. This is my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. His sneezings flash forth light. We're talking about Lord of the Rings stuff here. This is Smaug. Like a dragon is flying and, and flashing fire out of his mouth. And it's what it reads. I'm not making it up. And God's saying, you've got to see this and you've got to understand. I am so powerful that you shouldn't what? Question me. Let me encourage all of us. There's a point to battle with God, question God, talk to God, wrestle with God. There's also a point to say, Father, you are grand, big, glorious, holy, altogether other, bigger, smarter, wiser, all, everything. And in your sight, I'm actually nothing. And I will bow the knee to you. And I will stop questioning. And I will trust you. There's a point in your life where you need to come to that. And so, listen, these are fun questions. It's super cool to think about everything I set up here except for the actual Bible verses. Who knows? This is what's great about having a Christian life that has open-handed and closed-handed positions. By identifying something open-handed, you can give grace and love to those who disagree with you. And you can talk like a couple of idiots because only God knows. And you can laugh about it. So that's, that's one of those. Next question. How do we speak about unrighteous hypocrisy, evil in the church when asked by unbelievers in potential witnessing evangelical encounters? Really great question. So have you ever talked to someone and you get to this point where it's, it's almost embarrassing because you're saying, you're talking about Christ, you're talking about your church, and then the person gets frustrated to some degree or not, and they basically just share, hey, um, all you Christians are hypocrites. So why would I even bother? Why would I bother stepping foot into a church? Why would I bother going to Christ? If you all live the same way as everyone else, or you all live worse, because you say one thing and you do another, why would I do that? Great question. When I see a question like this, I think of, uh, of passages like Matthew 5, verse 14. You, Jesus speaking, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and, give it, give, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that may, they may see your what? Your words, your debates, your trolling on social media so they can see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In the Old Testament, the, the Israelites... We're supposed to be a people group that lived in such radically different ways that other Gentile groups around them would be drawn to the way Israel was living and drawn to Yahweh. 
in the New Testament, Christians are supposed to live in such a way that the outside world looks at Christians and goes, wow, why wouldn't I become a Christian? They bring light and life to everything around them. They are fair. They treat others with justice and mercy and love and grace and compassion. They help others and they don't ask for help. And yet, that's not what many of us in this room probably have experienced. Now, let me also admit, not everyone who claims the name of Christ, they, they might say they're with us, but they're not of us, are they? So let's admit that there are people out there, full-blown charlatans, who say that they love Christ or they put, um, uh, 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 how about I, I put it this way? Not every truck with a cross on it ends up in the church parking lot. Do you get what I'm laying down here? Just because someone says, I love Christ, God himself can look at you at the end of days and said, be gone, I never knew you. Scariest verse in the entire Bible. So when you're having these discussions back to this, here's what I think would be good. I think, number one, we acknowledge that um, truth is truth, and what they're saying is true. It is true. I have done business with people that claim to be Christians, and I regret it. Absolutely regret it. Lie, cheat, and steal. So I think it's right to say, yes, you're right. There are Christians out there who are hypocrites. You're right. I think it's also okay to say something like this. You know, you are right that there are Christians out there who, who don't treat others the, way, the right way, but um, I'm not a Christian because I have my life together. I'm not a Christian because I earned anything. I'm a Christian because I repented of my sin and I trust in Christ as my Savior, and I'm doing my, the best job that I can to follow him. And then I would adjust it. Now, I would adjust it this way unless you're a hypocrite this morning. So now I'm asking you to take a hard look in the mirror. I would adjust it and say, but for a moment, maybe we can stop, maybe you can stop thinking about all those people and you can put your eyes on me. Am I a hypocrite? Have I treated you unjustly? Have I been unloving and unkind to you? Do I say one thing and do another? Now, if you do, don't do what I just said, because you're a hypocrite. I can't do anything about, Alice and I were just talking this morning. We have no power to change anybody. Do you guys realize that? No power to change anybody. I can change me. I can repent of my sin, and I can follow Christ. That's the power that I have. I would encourage you to stop being a hypocrite if you're a Christian so that when you get into this discussion, you can look at someone and say, how about you just look at me? I'm a Christian. How did I treat you? And I pray that they can say, you know what? You've always been fair to me. You've always been loving to me. You've always been kind to me. Thank you. Awesome. Now, the second thing is, let's talk about you and God. Because all those people who we're judging right or wrong, they all have to stand before God and answer for their sins. They do. And the only correct answer is, I'm a sinner, I've fallen short, and there's nothing I can do to repay God for my sin. So I cast all my sin upon Jesus Christ, who was the perfect um, uh, redemption for me. He was the perfect plan. He was the perfect one. And he died for my sins, and I accept him as my Savior, and that's the best answer I have before a holy God. Here's an easy one. <clears throat> I was going to skip this question, so you've got to hang in there with me while I answer this one. Given the increased prevalence, great question, by the way, of the LGBTQ influence around the world, how can we as the church best demonstrate the love of Christ to LGBTQ identifying individuals? What does the Bible say to do when evangelizing someone who identifies with their sin? How should we, the congregation of Mountainside, address and welcome a member of the LGBTQ community who wishes to join our church in the hope they, they will be convinced of sin and turn away from acting on their personal temptation of sin? 
The reason for the question is that we, the church, welcome sinners and unbelievers in the hope that they will come to know grace through Christ. But it often seems that the LGBTQ sins are held to a different standard and their sin must be left at the door. Because of this, I do not know how to best support this lost group in our society that I act with every day. Great question. Fair question. So, um, I don't know, um, how many of you came through the door this morning and we checked your sin card? Anybody? Did we turn away anybody who, like, you came in, we asked you before you walked in the doors of the church about your sin this week, and then you answered wrong and we turned you away? No. So, churches, we don't check sin cards at the door, okay? We're here to minister to all people. This is a fine line because on the one hand, we accept all people as creating the image of God and under, um, and, uh, and Jesus still died for them. The blood is ready for them to receive, but it may not be applied yet. On the other hand, I get um, God explains what is right and what is wrong. I understand that sin hurts. It hurts communities. It hurts individuals. We cannot say that righteousness is sin. We cannot say that sin is righteousness. The Bible doesn't allow us to do that. We also can't hold certain sins up and just judge and destroy those sins because they're not the one that we do. The one that I do, I hide. The one that I don't like, I crush and yell about. That's not right. I think you only have two options when it comes to this. So I think there's two legitimate options. One, condemn. Condemn them and move away from them. I don't think you would treat someone this way who you cared about, but I do understand that some people have a, a view where it's like sin hurts people. I want to move away from it. I don't want it in my life. I don't want sin in my kids' lives. I don't want sin in my church. We don't want sin in the ranks. And I understand there's biblical ideas around that. But then I also remember that Jesus was a friend of sinners. And so I, I have to balance all of this. Um, how close to sin do I get? How far from sin do I get? What's going on? Where, are, where am I in, as an individual? Where are we at the church? And then this little voice behind me, always, Jesus was a friend of sinners. It doesn't look very friendly when I just condemn someone and yell at someone. I'm not recommending the option. I'm just saying you've got the option. Your second option is love. That's your other option. Condemn or love. Move yourself closer to the sinner. I'm not cha saying change your mind about sin. I'm simply saying avoid the judgment for a time. And here's the great news is y'all do this already. Everybody in this room... <clears throat> Everybody in this room has a loved one, someone you gave birth to, you raised, a friend, a family member, someone you love. Someone who is not saved. They're in their sin, they're not saved, and you love them. You care about them. I promise you, every time you see them, you don't lead with their sin. I promise you, you don't. You continue to hang in there. You continue to love them. You continue to show grace, mercy, compassion. You're trying to give it time, right? You're praying. You're doing all kinds of things other than your loved one comes in the door and you take their sin and you smash it straight in their face immediately. By the way, only a fool would do that because God doesn't do that to you. In fact, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 tells us that this, the goodness or the kindness of God that brings people to repentance. Churches do this by creating environments where people don't feel like they can be honest about their sin. They don't feel like they can wrestle. They will immediately be judged. George Bush once said this about Billy Graham. He said, Billy Graham didn't make you feel guilty. He made you feel loved. Hugh Halter says it this way. When people feel accepted, they move towards God's 
they move towards God much more easily. I'm up here saying I've seen that to be true. When, when you really judge, hate, push on people, they want to swing that pendulum against whatever you're about. I'm not saying you change your mind about their sin or their lifestyle. I'm not saying you call righteousness sin or sin righteousness. I'm simply saying you allow space for God to work. And what you're going to find is while he's working in their heart, he's also working in your heart as well. So when in doubt, here I'll, I'll, I'll close this one this way. When in doubt, pretend like you care about a stranger as much as you care about a wayward son or daughter. How's that? I, I know that you don't in your heart. You can't manufacture feelings is what I'm saying, but just pretend. Because if you have a wayward son or daughter, you have someone who you love and they're not walking with Jesus. I know that you love them so much that you're bending over backwards, you're serving, you're loving, you're giving room for God to work, you're hanging on, you're praying. I know that you're doing this. Do that for a stranger too. And you might see that God begins to work in their life or your life as well. Ultimately, here's the pessimistic side of me. This clash is really a clash between two very different worlds. And it often just doesn't end very well. But us as Christians, we are not to be disrespectful. We are not to be dishonorable. We are not to be unloving. We are not to be unkind. Last time I checked, you can hold lots of biblical views that nobody ever asked you about. You can hold them. And if someone asks you, you can graciously share with them. This is a tough one. But for me, it's more about love and who I care about. Finally, quickly, if Satan is a fallen angel, why wasn't he completely satisfied in heaven in the presence of God? Great question. Um, I think of a verse immediately. It's in, it's in Ezekiel. It's in Ezekiel 28. You can study this uh, later. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19 records, I don't want to get into the theological implications of this, but it essentially records Satan's fall. And in verse 17, uh, God says, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. In other words, Lucifer, Satan, fell out of heaven because he apparently became so impressed with his own beauty, intelligence, power, and position that he began to desire for himself the honor and glory that belonged to God alone. So the, son, the, the sin that corrupted Lucifer was self-generated pride. You guys, I, I got to tell you for a moment, there's a whole bunch of sins in America that we as Christians want to point out, and we are literally dumping gasoline on our own pride. It's pride that casts Satan out of heaven. Pride. Pride says I'm better. Pride says I know more. Pride says, I can do this on my own. If I was to summarize American hearts, it would be what the word pride. It's a disgusting sin. And it literally lives in all of us. And we're so busy pointing out other sins, we just let it fester. You've got to destroy your pride. You have to. It will eat you up. It will totally, it will totally destroy you. <clears throat> so Satan must have had at least one opportunity to finish this up. He must have had an opportunity to make a decision. The Bible also says that a number of angel, angels also made that decision where they would follow. If you want a bunch more information on this and demonic activity amongst Christians, I'm teaching here at Adair in September, in September. So you can come to, we're going to have a special, actually we're going to have a special rooted night here in September, and I'll be teaching on demonic activity. Um, with that, I want to apologize. Um, we have not had all communion together as much as we used to. Um, when we were at DePoli, it was always the first of the month. We would always do communion together. 
and then COVID happens and chaos happens and we get kicked out and we're here in the nights and we're in a park in the days and it's just been a lot of chaos and I want to apologize for not getting us back into a better rhythm. And so starting today, first Sunday of every month, we'll be taking communion together. So as JT comes forward with the worship team, um, let me just walk you through this. I will, um, uh, you'll come forward and take the elements. You'll wait on that. And then I will lead us uh, through communion. We also did, did everybody a favor and we returned to the uh, old COVID way. And so you're going to grab two cups um, because I think I nearly spilled on myself the last time fiddling with the wrapper. And so um, we've got bread and cup together, two cups that you'll grab. And then I'll just walk us through communion together. Again, uh, so it'll be during um, the first Sunday of every month, we'll do all communion. Uh, during uh, this first song, we'd ask that you would file forward, take the elements, return to your seats. If you don't yet know Christ as your Savior, don't take communion, please. <clears throat> it's funny how we do this. It's like um, communion's for believers. Um, there's nothing magical. It doesn't become anything. It's, it doesn't give you an elixir. It doesn't do anything. It's just a, simply a remembrance of what Christ did for us. If you don't yet know Christ as your Savior, here's what I want to beg of you. Make today your day of salvation. Come forward afterwards. Talk to me. Talk to Pastor Dave. We would love to explain what Christ has done for you and how much he really loves you. So during this first song, if you're a believer and you want to partake of communion, wonderful. File forward. Take the elements. <clears throat> 